Is there a strategy that'll help you grow your company faster? CEO Sales Strategies is an investigative business podcast for entrepreneurial people who never stop asking questions. Highly acclaimed sales revenue growth expert, Doug C. Brown, interviews CEOs, business owners, and professionals who serve them to uncover and share actionable tips and methods behind their bulletproof sales strategies. Topics covered on the show include their failures, struggles, secrets, and processes that help them succeed in selling millions to billions of dollars of their products and services, all with the sole aim of helping you grow your business. If you are eager to know the most effective sales secrets from the A players of the game, then the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast is certainly the place to be. Hey, this is Doug Brown, and welcome to another episode of the CEO Sales Strategy Podcast, where you hear great insights on people who have built multi million to multi billion dollar companies. So today we have a good friend of mine. His name is Gene McNaughton. He's a CEO of a, a major company at this point. Uh, but prior to, Gene was regarded as one of the foremost experts in business growth. And he's done this for Fortune 500 companies. He has a long leadership and achievement uh, history as a consultant, public speaker, and public trainer, sales trainer. Uh, his 30 years experience uh, spans decades at like gateway computers. He was literally the right-hand man for Tony Robbins and Chet Holmes. And he had his own consulting business called Growth Smart Consulting. His expertise in sales, leadership, management, uh, coaching, development, training, you name it, both in sales and support of the personnel has led him to successes in implementing strategies for organizations as small as $2 million and as large as $2.5 billion per year. Now, one of the things in this episode that I want you all to pay attention to is Gene and I talk a lot about the business owner CEO commitment to driving revenue through the company. And this is so important that CEOs and business owners understand that they're the driver of this revenue through the company. They just can't delegate it off. And we have to have measurements and metrics around this. And everything has to be inspected consistently because people inspect and those people who inspect get respect. So pay close attention to that. We're going to go into a, a lot of facets. There's a, a different things that we unpacked regarding you know, uh, sales forecasting and ways to get this to happen better for you. Oh, also, one of the things on this episode is normally we go 30 minutes or so. This is going to take uh, a little bit longer because Gene and I got going. So you're probably going to have this about 50, 55 minutes before we're done. But there's a lot of great stuff in here. So please pull up uh, a pen, a paper, and write down and take notes here because you're going to learn a lot. Give it a listen. Let's welcome Gene to the call. Hey, everybody, welcome to the CEO Sales Strategy Podcast. Today, I have an amazing guest today. His name is Mr. Gene McNaughton. And Gene and I have known each other well over a decade, and almost a decade and a half. And Gene, I want to welcome you to the show. So glad to be here, Doug. It's like the good old days back in 2007 when we first met, working with Chet Holmes. Yes, yes. So Gene was uh, one of the high-end consultants at that time in the Chet Holmes organization, if I remember correctly, Gene, is that right? That's right. That's right. And so Gene and I got to work on some projects, uh, whether it was uh, I had them first and then he got them, or whether it was even collaboration going on. And we worked on a lot of companies that were doing far more than $5 million a year. Uh, Gene, what's the biggest company that you worked on, uh, whether it's inside that organization or even in your own consulting business? Well, the biggest one was the very first deal that really started the consulting division of the Chet Holmes group. It was a company out of Mexico called Homex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, power to Chet's ability to drive leads. If you remember, Doug, he used to do his advertising on the radio, call and get a free chapter of my best-selling book, leave us a voicemail with your email. And the president, the CEO and owner of the largest home developer in Mexico called in and he said he wanted to hire Chet. And it was at that point in my career where I was working for a company that did small business coaching and we were doing fine, but it was right at the crux. So think 2006, 2007 of the crisis that most people listening to this lived through. 
And Chet, I reached out to Chet. We had become acquaintances due to Tony Robbins. Tony had introduced me to Chet. And I happened to reach out to Chet. I always knew, you know, one thing about knowing somebody's calendar and knowing somebody's patterns, I always knew that Chet ran meetings for 50 minutes. And he'd always leave that 10 minutes to go to the bathroom, to get something to drink, to stretch out and get to his next call. So I strategically called him at 12.55 p.m., kind of not thinking he would pick me up, but I just called to check in. And he goes, well, Gene, you don't sound that happy. And I'm like, well, I'm doing okay. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, how'd you like to join me in our consulting division? I'm like, well, why is that? He said, well, I just had a guy call in from Mexico. He's the CEO of some big company. If we close that deal, it'll be your first deal. And I said, okay, I'm interested. Who's in the division? He said, just you. <laughs> right? You'll be the president. And we got to that call and it was a, a, a Mexican company out of Mexico where some people spoke Spanish and we had translators on the call and he introduced me. I'll still remember. I still remember to this day. He introduced me as the El Presidente is how he said it. I don't think he said it right, but everybody <laughs> got a good laugh out of it, but that turned into being a, now they were a $900 million company, a legit big company. And they needed help on marketing, sales, public relations, everything, hiring, compensation structures, metrics, management, measurement. And that was a company that, this is honest to goodness truth, paid us well over a million dollars in consulting fees, mm -hmm. right? That's, I mean, that's a big deal. I don't care what firm, if you're with, you know, KPMG, that's a huge deal. But in the realm of that, we helped them go from $900 million our first year to $1.4 billion the second year. And by the third year, they were doing $1.7 billion. Now, nothing changed in their marketplace. The prices of the homes they sold didn't change. Their competition didn't change. The landscape, the economic landscape, not only didn't change, it actually got worse because they trailed the United States economically by about 12 to 18 months. And it was a pure example of having discipline in how they marketed, how they sold, how they measured and how they managed that had a dramatic impact on the success of that company. Well, that's a really that interesting. A, that was a long answer to your question. No, it Sorry. was a perfect answer to the question. I remember the account too. So it's, uh, and I remember you working in, and I believe it was somewhere around a hundred thousand plus a month that we were pulling in out of it uh, as a company. And but you bring up a really good point because, you know, on the CEO sales strategies, we, we, you know, we look at it and we go, okay, from 900 million to, you know, 1.4 to 1.7 billion, you know, there's got to be some kind of secret that happened there. Right. Um, and is the secret in this case, discipline, or was the secret in, in something, you know, discipline plus. If, if I had to narrow it down, it was the CEO's commitment to excellence and growth. Now, depending on how big your staff is for the listen, listener, you may be an army of one or five or 500, or in that case, they had 7,000 employees, 3,000 salespeople. His commitment to make sure that this wasn't just a training exercise, it wasn't just a feel good exercise, was the most important part. And for anybody listening right now, that's the business leader, I would say the same thing to you, your commitment to seeing it through. It's one thing for sellers to go through a training program and maybe they get inspired. Maybe they feel good about it. Maybe they learn some bits and bites along the way, but it's another thing to commit to systematizing your, you know, it's just called full funnel management, how you market all the measurement systems in your organic, your paid spend, what you're doing on the web, what you're doing for SEO, like putting management metrics along with goals in place, then to the sales process, all the way from something turns into a lead to its conversion, to the conversion percent, to the average sales price, to the referrals. And that's what this man did. He committed, he, he picked the system that he felt, felt was best for him. In his case, it was Chet Holmes and the Business Breakthroughs group. But he picked a system as the CEO and committed to seeing it through. Now, that meant making sure his vice presidents were seeing it through, 
the directors under them were seeing it through, the sales managers were seeing it through, all the way down to human resources, how they hired to the onboarding training of the reps. He committed to a system. And that's, you know, if anybody asked me for advice, you know, whether you pick Doug or pick, you know, a Chet Holmes group or who, whoever it is you pick, vet them, but then commit to seeing the system through. That is where the growth comes from. So business owners, CEOs, others listening to this call, hear those words, seeing it through, the commitment to seeing it through. Now, you wouldn't think that was a growth strategy, but I can tell you, you know, Gene and I worked on, I don't know, combined probably thousands of accounts, but the, <laughs> um, we can, I can concretely back this up that one of the biggest challenges that companies, Gene, that I see have is their CEO is not that committed. They, they, it's a nice idea. They want to grow. They want to get there, but they're not becoming the executive sponsor and forcing, if you will, that transition of commitment throughout the organization. And do you see that? I mean, that was with Homex. Do you see that with any other organization as well that you've worked with? Well, I, I've consulted 159 companies. I keep track. And these are not you know, going for a keynote or a half day or a two day session. These are, I only can consider it a consulting relationship when I've spent six months or more with them. And almost all of them, when I come in and Doug, you were taught this same thing. When you come in as a consultant, the first thing you want to do is an audit, which means you want to look at their processes, their systems, their methods, their, how they measure and manage. And then you want to confidentially interview people under confidentiality so they can tell you what their opinion is. And I, it would just became a regular, I could anticipate that somebody would say is you're the flavor of the month. <laughs> you know, we had this group in and we had the spin group in and we had uh, Miller Hyman in, we've had, you know, name, name all, you know, a lot of great trainings out there. And what would happen is the consistent theme was the CEO would be fired up or the VP of sales or, you know, whatever CSO. And they'd say, we're going to commit to this. They'd get everybody the book. They'd, They'd bring in the person as the keynote and then they would lose track of it. They wouldn't follow it all the way through. And that became one of the defining moments as a consultant in talking to the CEO, because we were fortunate, Doug, that we had so many people coming at us, wanting to hire us to, to work with their company. We had the good fortune of basically saying, why should we pick you? Yes. I mean, you want to talk about the preeminent sales pitch to say, look, there's 10 people that want to hire us. We can only take on five. So you tell me why we should let you hire us. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. But the defining element before I would say yes to somebody was, I need your commitment, Mrs. CEO or Miss CEO or Mr. CEO, that what we teach, you're going to hold your people accountable to the execution. And because we were so disciplined, Doug, and I, I know you still are on having the measurement systems in place. It's one thing to do a training exercise, two days, three days, or today maybe you're doing virtual online universities or you have a talented trainer within your organization or a talented sales leader that can package up the, the sales training itself. It, it's one thing to do the training and, and to, to you know, check the box and say, yep, we did the training and we went through these processes and methodology and everybody took the test and signed off. But people forget that it's not just an exercise of futility. It's not just check the box to say, yes, we did training. It is to cause changed behavior in the organization. Part of the reason, you know, when we do these audits is I'm asking myself, okay, where is the company at? And let's say the company's at $10 million a year in revenue. I'll pick a number. I want to understand everything it is they're doing to get to 10 million. And you, you, can, you can broadly group it, how they market, how they sell, how they manage, how they track and measure. If we just kept it simple like that, there's a lot of sub, you know, sub tick, tick marks underneath that. But if you kept it at those broad levels, because ultimately the result, the 10 million a year, is the result of their behaviors, actions, and patterns as a business. Now, if the CEO says, I believe we should be at 15 or 20 or 100, then it's our job, our collaborative job, Doug, as we've done together to say, okay, 
here's what needs to change. Here's what needs to be added. Here are the you know, things that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. Right. And that all comes out of, you know, assessing the business. And that's why if you're a business owner that's stuck or your company isn't performing at the level you think they're capable of, it is so intelligent of you to have an independent person come in and look at it and give you their perspective. Even if you pay for that, because what happens is, is when you pay for somebody's perspective, you're going to pay a heck of a lot more attention to their opinion. Without question. And, you know, Gene, I think you brought up some really good points here. You know, one of, one of the things, you know, companies, many times they think, okay, we're going to train our people and we're going to increase the skill sets of the people. But when you went back to the behaviors, the actions and the patterns of the behavior, where you're measuring, and I know you're a measurement master, like you're, <laughs> I remember, you know, some of the, some of the details that you measure, but measuring those metrics all the way through tells a story and that story allows that CEO or whoever to hold these people accountable to the change. I love what you said. It's, you know, about change in behavior. It moves the needle within the company. And what percentage of CEOs or business owners do you think out there do that? Like on a, you know, when we look at the, you know, like these companies are doing extremely well, these companies are marginal, these companies are, you know, declining. Do you see it as a, as a common thread where the commitment of the CEO or the business owner at that point? Well, here, here's the common thread I see with the best CEOs that I've worked with. One is they're very good at acknowledging what they're not good at. They're comfortable saying we are good here, but we suck there. And that's why you know they're, they're bringing me in. We really suck at this. Also, Every good sales, excuse me, CEO or and or sales leader, one of the common attributes is they they have uh, let's call it financial or metric awareness. They run their business by dashboards. They have the ability to dive in when they need to dive in. And you know, in the early days, go all the way back to the 2009, 10, 11, and 12. There were many companies I'd go into, big companies, billion dollar companies, that didn't have measurement systems in place, or at least ones they could believe in. You know how many companies I've gone into, Doug, that proudly said that they use salesforce.com, which really is the best, I think the best CRM. Yet when I inspected and looked at their dashboards, I found the common pattern was that while each seller and manager and leader had Salesforce and they were spending on average $100 person, $100 per person per month, I, yeah, I found one company out of 159 that were actually using the capability of salesforce.com. Yes. You know, when I could go to a CEO and say, how much do you believe in your pipeline or forecast, right? They're different. Forecast and pipeline are different. And they'd say, not very much. Why is that? Well, and I, and I ask, how, how do they get their, their forecasts? And the CEO would say, uh, some people send it by spreadsheet. Some people send, he goes, I don't, one guy said, I don't know. Some people color it on a piece of paper. I don't know. Right. So th there's no, I mean, if you think about inaccurate forecasts and inaccurate pipelines, if you're in a product distribution business and you've got to order your materials and your quantities from China, I mean, that is a immense drain of profitability if you can't get accurate numbers. And many of the companies, you know, in the last few years, most of the companies I've worked with are big companies. When I get into their measurement systems, they're proud of the system. They're not proud of the results they're getting. And that's because of a few things. One is they did their tertiary three to five hours of training at the rep level. And they said, go do it. And because there weren't managers inspecting the metrics and there wasn't somebody above them inspecting the metrics, and there wasn't somebody at the top demanding accurate metrics, that it was a waste of money. So that's one of the first things I get into is show me how you get your numbers, show me the numbers, what is your believability of the numbers? And, you know, modern day, I'm finding more companies in tune with that, but still not at a level where you would expect. Well, modern day, they have to be because of all of the uncertainty that's been going on. So if they're not doing it now, they're gonna, they're gonna see, because as we both know, Lack of measurement equals bleed. And, you you know, as you said, it's bleed in profitability, but it's also bleed in being able to be 
able to uh, capitalize on something in the market because they don't have the actual cash to do it or opportunity cost is lost in some capacity as well. So this measurement for those of you who are leaning in, and if you're not, I would, those uh, measurements and the metrics that Gene is talking about and holding people accountable to that, it, it just, it has magical effect. Um, and if you're using Salesforce or whatever CRM you're using, and you're not regularly looking at these metrics, looking at these numbers, they tell you the story. So you want to be looking at these on a very consistent basis. And, you know, it's, it, it blows my mind, Gene, because, you know, if you go to a CPA, they'll, they'll say, well, let's pull the balance sheet and let's pull the P&L and let's pull this and pull that, right? And they have all these metrics on the financial side and that tells a story. But when it comes to the actual sales revenue growth components of most companies, they kind of leave it, like you said, well, the guy writes it on, you know, the forecast on crayon on a paper <laughs> or, um, you know, or, you know, we have our, we get a meeting once a week and they all shout out their numbers. And it's like, how does a company plan budgets on something like that and be accurate? And, and today in 2021, where budgets really need to be flexible, I believe forecasts need to be accurate as all possibilities can drive that forecast to be accurate. Um, otherwise, you know, the company could uh, make a, a, a really bad mistake. What's your thoughts on something? I, I, well, I was, when I got involved in a relationship here in Southern California, this was a company that sold um, consumer products. That's probably the best way to put it. And they had to order all of their materials and supply from China and get it shipped over. And they had a giant warehouse. And the day that I got there, there was a, there was uh, uh, like banners, like things hung up, like in the bathroom. Hey, we're having an employee, uh, some like an employee special product sale, whatever it was. But ultimately what it was is they had misforecast. They far over ordered their supplies. And then they were opening it up to the employees to go buy at cost so they could clear the warehouse. <laughs> Right. And I'm like, how does that happen? He goes, because we had the wrong, the pipeline wasn't right. The forecast was wrong. We over forecasted, we under delivered. Now the products we're carrying are out of date. It was a technology company. So they, so it's just that, and that became one of the prevailing elements. Cause I, I talked to the CEO and I said, just imagine the day that's not this far away where if you want to know the forecast, you can look it up on your phone at a stoplight through salesforce.com. There weren't dashboards built. There weren't, you know, a good dashboard would say, I know my key performance indicators of what's most important. And if I want to dive deeper, I can click that button and I can get into the depths of anything I want to get into. And, you know, that revolutionized that business. If you think about the amount of effort and time and energy and employee hours that were lost in wrongfully ordering too much supply and sellers not being able to fulfill their demand or what, what their forecasts were. Think how much money that cost this company. Now this is a half billion dollar company. So it wasn't like the end of the world for them, but you know, this CEO reports to a board and that board is populated by the venture capitalists that bought the company and brought him in. So his job was to get all this figured out. And our, our, you know, there's a lot of people that can claim to do, let's call it sales training or how to hunt big accounts and customer service training and so forth. But this guy's issue was, was not just the sales training, which they needed. That's, that's what got me in the door. But what they needed is what you do, Doug, is they needed, people don't really want sales training. They want the growth that comes along with sales training. Absolutely. And what I, what I tell CEOs and I'll tell this audience is growth. There's three things required for growth. And that is tuning up your marketing, tuning up sales process and measuring the stuffings out of it. Not in a micromanagement way, but in a standards way. What happens is, is when companies go through this transition of saying, okay, everybody needs to adhere to salesforce.com. Here's a, here's another story. I see Doug all the time. I look at the dashboards of sales reps activity within salesforce.com and you can see it. It's like this 
low level, low level. Then there's this giant blip and then it goes down and goes back. Then there's a giant dip. And I said, let me guess, you had a come to Jesus meeting and told everybody, if you didn't use Salesforce, you were going to get fired. So everybody used it. Managers didn't inspect it. And six months later, you were back to where you were. And he goes, how'd you know? And I'm like, it's right there in your data. Right. Right. So we go back to our basic theme for everybody listening, which is pick a lane, you know, vet the various options and programs and people out there that are trying to sell you their methods, vet them, make the best decision you can. And whatever one you pick, stick with it, see it all the way through. So it becomes the normal operating behavior of your company, management, leaders, marketers, sellers. When new hires come on, they're trained into the, the system. Well, in, in doing that alone, Gene, I think that was a, a, a huge gem for people because just doing that alone, pick a lane and focus on it, that creates more activity. And if we're focused on any activity and we increase the activity amount right there, we're going to yield something out of it, some result, somehow. Never ceases to amaze me at, you know, when we look at companies and we go, you, there's no referrals going on whatsoever in this company or whatever it might be, right? And then we just install a program to make an active referral program happen. All of a sudden, they're starting to see new revenues come in that they hadn't seen in the last five years because people aren't doing it. But it goes back to exactly what you said in the beginning, that commitment of the CEO to make sure that their the executive staff is seeing it through down through the management ranks uh, on bigger companies or an owner. Uh, you know, if you own a 10, $20 million company, you know, you're, you, you're the gal, a guy who's got to be doing this and, you know, driving this on a consistent basis, increasing activity alone will start to increase more sales because frankly, most salespeople, this has been my experience, Gene, please correct me if I'm incorrect. Most salespeople, they just try to pick the, the easy fruit off the tree and they're not doing the, the consistent activity to pick up long-term sales whether it be referrals or expansion of the sale or even you know basic follow up a common courtesy they're dropping the ball on these steps along the process so therefore the bleed is happening on the company and if the company's just looking at top line revenue and going well okay we made some profit this year what they don't realize is there may be another 10% or more <laughs> underneath all that that is just not going to happen do you agree or disagree i 100% agree now here's the benefit of getting you know pick your pick your lane on terms of what you're going to track and let's just keep it very simple and generic you've got let's just say from sales you've got leads right you got inquiries somebody comes to your website fills out a form somebody makes a phone call somebody walks in your building that's an inquiry then you have a lead that has some level of interaction with your employees then is it a qualified lead right? Somebody came in the store, they were deemed a lead, but they were looking for something that you didn't have per se. I'm metaphorically speaking. They came to your website. They filled out a form. They wanted X, but you do Y. Great. That's not a qualified lead. A qualified lead then would go to, ultimately the goal would be, are you going to propose a solution with, with a price point on it? Right? There's another metric. How many leads turned into proposals? Next metric, how many proposals turned into sales. Next metric, that's called the conversion percent. Net me next metric, what is the average sales price of your sales? That's another metric, right? Now, if you just, let's just say th th those are six simple metrics that apply to virtually any company. And I think it's fair to say, Doug, and to the listeners that there isn't anything in your life that if you put immense focus on it for 30 to 60 days that you couldn't improve by 10%, right? Yeah, without like question. Doug, mm -hmm. If you put, a, you're in shape already, but even if you put immense focus on it for 60 days, could you cut your body fat percent by 10%? Yes. I mean, that'd be going from 15% to 13.5% with immense focus. And maybe you got some external help. You had a, a workout coach, you had a dietitian, you followed a keto or one of the millions of diets out there. But if you stayed with it for 60 days, there isn't anything. You could get 10% stronger. 
I don't know how, how you measure somebody being smart, but you could get 10% smarter over 60 days by immersing yourself in books on the subject matter of your choice. Now, if you think about your business, and let's say you had, you had six key measuring points, and you said, okay, we're going to go to work for the next 60 days to improve each of these individual metrics by 10%. So if you had 100 leads in a month, your goal is 110. We're not talking astronomical lifts. You had, um, let's say, 50 of those leads out of those 100 turn into uh, proposals. You're going to go from 50 to 55. You had a 20% conversion on those proposals. You're going to try to go from 20% to 22%. I'm talking 10%. You had an average sales price of $5,000. You're going to see what you can do about getting that to 5500 right? I mean, you just think about, hopefully somebody's, the, the light bulbs are going off that you put laser beam focus. Then you have reward mechanisms in place for those early adapters that actually follow the changed behaviors. And I will add this, in some cases, just through pure brute force, uh, a demanding CEO or business leader can drive this 5%, 10% change across the board just through purely looking at the numbers every day, reminding people, et cetera. But when you package in the how-to from an expert, a, a business growth expert, a, a sales expert, a marketing expert, a CRM expert, or hopefully you get one company that can do it all, and so it's not just brute forcing through measurements, metrics, and demanding, but you're giving them the tools and the skill sets. It's almost impossible not to grow unless there's an external circumstance that affects your entire industry. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I just, this, I, I'm guessing there are heads nodding out there right now going, that's so true. And, and it's as simple as that. Now, there's work that needs to be done, but you, you pick out, Six key performance indicators, six key metrics. Now, I haven't even talked about marketing and what you spend on your website, what you spend on advertising, what you do on paid spend through Google and social media. You can apply the exact same metrics to that. Now, if you talk about the phrase that I really like is total funnel management. The dollars you spend on salaries for your marketers, or hourly wages to your consultants, to the experts you bring in for your paid spend, whatever. But if you really play that all the way out, there can be at least 10, in some cases, 15 key performance metrics that you can look at on a dashboard. And if you're, if you're laser beam going at it to say, I'm going to improve each of those 3%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that over eight touch points can double and triple your business. Well, Gene, I, I just did the numbers on the, on the example you gave, you know, just, uh, you know, it's an extra five sales, five sales a month, let's say, right. And that was five sales at 5,500. So the 60 sales at $5,500, that's an extra $330,000 in revenue coming in just off. That's very, I would call it a very straightforward and basic example. Now, if you compound that over 15 different areas, it folks, here's the deal. Get 1% better a day in 70 days, you'll be twice as good. So what do you think you'll be? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> right? <laughs> do the math, right? So if, if, if you had 15 areas over the next six months in your business that were being optimized, and as Gene's saying, just 3%. If 10% if seems a little wow, then go 3%. Watch what happens to your business in the, in the revenue increase that comes into your company. As long as you go back to the first rules you were talking about, Gene, commitment from the top down and all the way through the ranks. And, you know, don't let people get happy ears. You know, when, it drives me crazy when I go into, Gene, I'm going to vent here. It drives me crazy when I go into companies and, and they're doing these forecasts and they're saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, here's what I'm going to have. Here's what I'm going to have. And they're not challenging them at all. They're just looking at and they go, well, wait a minute. Okay, well, this guy just, you know, said he'll do 300,000. This gal said she'll do 350, you know. He, you know, and, and, and the reality is they're going to do 180, right? So there's break points on all this stuff. But imagine if you enabled your sales team, just as a point, 
to give you accurate forecasts because you didn't beat them up if they didn't hit if they didn't hit quota one month, right? Or they didn't hit that forecast every month, or you know, all of these things that come into play. A lot of times, management is actually I find invoking the sales channel to actually tell non-truths about what they're going to close because they don't want to be signaled out in the middle of a meeting or something like that for, what do you mean, Jerry, you're only doing half your quota this month. Well, I've been three, three X over quota for the last four months, you know, well, Jerry, you're a bad guy, you know? And it's like, Jerry doesn't want to hear that. And no one else in the room wants to hear that. So no happy years in the management meetings, (laughs) you know, straightforward metrics, measurements, let the data tell the story, commit to the process, Pick a lane, as Gene was saying, and just go over your your optimization points and just keep growing them. Hey, Doug, I'll I'll add, I got to add something really important. There is a clear, distinctive difference between laying out clear measurement systems and accountability versus beating up the team. And, you know, it's... There, there will be some chasm if your company's moving from, you know, kind of measuring and looking and some accountabilities and so forth, and then saying, okay, we're going to move to very clear accountabilities and there's certain base metrics that we all got to hit. And they're like, oh my God, you're micromanaging me. No, you're not micromanaging. All you're doing is clarifying the standards of your organization. And there'll be some bumps along the way. There are going to be some people that, you know, I, I find a, a uh, correlation between top performers and lack of detail in CRM and Salesforce.com, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? They just, hey, I just want to go make the sales, man. I don't, I don't want to do all this other stuff. But that, and these are hurdles that are, are um, predictable hurdles that any business leader will have to overcome. But it doesn't withstand the importance of if you want to be a big company, you've got to behave like a big company. You don't get big and then start behaving big. You behave big before you are big. So regardless of what size you are, this, you know, I didn't know if we were going to go in this direction, Doug, on this call, because we didn't, we didn't like, you didn't lay out a script or anything like that, but I'm speaking from the heart that it is a must. If you want to go from two to 5 million or five to 10 or 10 to a hundred, you got to behave like that goal company. And there are plenty of great models out there. Or you go find a, a Doug Brown or somebody that does what Doug does that has 25, 30 years of building businesses that, you know, Doug, at this stage, I mean, like, I'll just speak for myself and you can share, but I'm not, it is a rare day that I go into a company that I see something that I don't go, wow, I've never seen that. <laughs> no, like I can I'm, go in and say, well, if, if I can just look at some dashboards and have a couple interviews, then a lot of it is, is predictable because companies run the same patterns. And, you know, uh, I once had a mentor, Gene, say to me, you know, Doug, there's not a lot of wow thinking out there. There's a lot of good thinking because oh, most wow. things have already been thought of, right? So in business is very simple if they run by the rules of the business, right? Money out, Minus money in equals something, right? To have profit, loss, or, or gain. And so if, if people look at their business in that regard and they are applying these metrics, those metrics tell them the money out, money in, they tell them the story. And so this is a one way of them being able to proactively be able to correct course. And I agree with Eugene, they, they may get some pushback from the people who have been there and, you know, this is the way we did it. I remember when I was in the military, they, you know, 1981, people used to walk around going, we, we didn't do it this way in Korea, you know, and, and, um, you know, the same thing will happen in organizations as well. But Gene is so right. So right on this folks, that if you want to be at the next level of your growth, you got to start acting like you're at the next level of your growth. And that might be getting a little bit out of your comfort zone to be able to do that. Um, however, you know, the best companies out there and Gene's worked with 159 of them. And I've worked with hundreds of them as well. And we can both tell you from experience, whether it's building our own companies, you know, because Gene, you're also a CEO of a company as well, right? Yes. (laughs) So uh, 
you know, whether it's building our own companies or, or helping our clients build their companies, the business basics still apply across the board. And if you just measure those and let the accountability, I used to love what uh, Chet used to say, you know, he'd walk around all the time, Chet Holmes and say, you know, people in uh, respect what you inspect. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and <laughs> even, you know, in that context that it is so true. So if you're the CEO or a business owner of your company and you're not holding that commitment and we're not measuring by the metrics and you want to grow, there is no other choice unless you grow by, I would say, accident gene. Or is that, you know, just haphazard circumstance, you know, something happened? Well, the, there are companies that grow. What, what's that old saying? The rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah, well, Zoom's a good, good example of that, right? They were a good company before, but now they're a huge company. Yeah, I mean that that was a that's a perfect example. You know, there there's an external environmental situation or industry situation that creates unusual, unpredicted demand for what it is you sell. Here's a great example. If anybody knows my background, my first real job out of college was with a tiny little computer company called Gateway Two Thousand. I started on the night shift selling computers over the phone. And it was, I just was the right place at the right time. And suddenly this pers PC, personal computer revolution exploded. Go back to 1991, when the only time you, you know, could have access to a computer maybe was at your school because they were so expensive. Then companies like Gateway and Dell came out and said, shoot, we can keep our overhead low and make these computers so they're like $2,000 or $3,000. Suddenly it became affordable for homes and small businesses to buy computers. And then big businesses could buy a computer for everybody that was at a desk. So right place, right time. We had the right offering and we marketed well, we sold well. And that little company turned into over the court. When I joined the company, they were you know, $50 million dollars. 10 years later, it was an $11 billion company, global. You know, when I was there, I think I was, you know, it was less, I don't know, less than 500 employees. In 2001, we had 21,000 employees, did 11 billion in revenue. So right place, right time. Still doesn't guarantee that you're going to grow like everybody else. We made some right moves, but I still remember the day of going from, Every month seemed like there was a new record broken, new record broken, new record broken. And suddenly we brought in new executive management because the, the owner of the company wanted to go public. So we had to go hire a, a, a very high-end COO. And suddenly there was accountability and there were measurements and metrics and roll-ups. And, uh, and then we go public and then your metrics become unbelievably important. When you're doing, you know, you're representing a big part of the, the, I was running the public sector by the time I left, that was all government, state and local government, all higher ed K through 12, about an $800 million piece of business. I had to know my metrics. That was uncomfortable for me. I was the get in front of the room. Let's get going. Let's go tear the cover off the ball. We can do it. We're going to, we're going to dominate, you know, just get everybody fired up and train all this stuff. I was just intuitively good at I was passionate about. So when you're passionate about something and you read about it and you study it, you, you can get good over time. And then I had to turn into a numbers and metrics guy. And frankly, in the early phases of that, I was the weak link on the leadership team. I was not an Excel wizard or, um, you know, able to do, you know, all these funky things on spreadsheets and put, pivot you know, tables. There was no CRM. There was no Salesforce. Mm -hmm. But when you have a huge division and you're relying on pipeline reports from a hundred different people, some are on the inside, some are in the field, you know, some are drawing it on a piece of paper. Some are using Word. some are using Excel. It was a stressful situation. And little did I know, you know, 10 years later, like Doug Brown would be saying, yep, Gene is a metrics wizard. Well, if you would have seen me when I started, I was the, I was not, I, it was, it was an uncomfortable area for me, but I had to get good at it. I had to, there was no choice. So I turned, you know, my weakness into 10 years later, it was a strength. And that's what will work for you too, folks. If you go out there and actually do what we're talking about, do what Gene's talking about here. Gene, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, how do they do that? 
What would be the best well, ways? You know, LinkedIn is one of my favorite social media channels. For the, find me on LinkedIn. Also, I wrote a book that became a bestseller in 2018. God, it seems like yesterday. It was almost three years ago. But I give away a free chapter. My The very best chapter, I think, the most unique chapter on how to run the perfect first meeting. And it's free. So there's no, you're not going to get into some, you know, 8,000 emails coming at you or anything like that. Um, go to thesalesedge.co, thesalesedge.co, and download the chapter. And that's the one chapter that, you know, you, you read enough sales books, about 70, 75% of any good sales book is going to have some of the same things. Mindset, how to build rapport, the importance of follow through and asking for referrals, right? There's a lot of great ones out there. And then all of the greatest ones have unique things. This is the most unique thing to me, which is really my, what do you want to call it? Recipe to how to set yourself up to run a great meeting. If you look online, Doug, there is no shortage anywhere of people that say, we are the lead generation experts and you can use our widget, our wadget, our SDRs, our BDRs, our automated this and automated that to get leads. Everybody's talking about getting leads. Nobody's talking about what do you do with the leads you got, right? That's what this chapter is about. How do you get the most out of those leads that you, the business leader are paying for? Right? And that's, you pay for them. When you put a dollar towards your website, you're paying for lead gen. When you put a dollar towards search engine spend or paid spend, you, you, you pay a marketer full-time, part-time, whatever, you are paying them for lead generation. So and remember, you put as much attention on running those meetings, having measurement systems to say, did the meeting turn into a second meeting? Did that meeting turn into a proposal? Did that proposal turn into a conversion? What was the value of that conversion? That's why this phrase full funnel management is so important to you. Little story here, Gene. I, I, I took one metric one time. I worked with this company that were doing 48 million. So Gene talked about six stages or six steps, right? In the beginning of this process. And so we were doing a very similar thing. And what I found is, you know, you go from stage zero to stage one. Well, that means, you know, as Gene just said, you get a lead. And by the way, leads, when you're paying for those, those are money out. So you need money coming back in on that lead, or you're going to have a negative at the end of that uh, equal sign. So Gene, they were doing 48 million. And I discovered by measuring. Now, this company had been in business for six years. And I measured just like you're talking about. And what I found was that the lead going into stage one, which was the first contact, if you will, 62% of the time was not happening. Wow. Now, this company was generating thousands of leads literally a week sometime. They had a pretty big sales team. And so I went to the CEO, and this is going back to the commitment thing you're talking about. I went to the CEO and I said, listen, I got good news. I got bad news. <laughs> what do you want to hear first? And I uh, said, well, tell me the good news. I said, you're, if you do the right things here, I bet you'll double your revenue in a period of time. He said, what's the bad news? I said, 62% of your you know, incoming leads are never making it to stage one. It's just not happening. He said, you are crazy. There is no way that is happening. And Gene, as we would do, we take the spreadsheet and we go, here you go. Here's the report, right? And we put, I put it in front of him. Two days later, he took the first day to really throw things around his office. The second day, he calls me back and he says, let's fix this. Long story short, two years later, they went from $48 million to $110 million because that front end of the funnel that you're talking about, the front end of the lead push, was now going all the way through the process. So they got that down. You know, the first month it dropped by 25%. Second month it dropped about 20%. Third month, and we kept working on it over the six-month period. So folks, what Gene's telling you works. He's a genius. If you're liking what you hear, I highly urge you to contact him and uh, at the salesedge.co, download his book and heck, go buy his book on Amazon, right? Because the book is a really good book. Hey, and Doug, I'll vouch Doug, can I add, Doug, can I add one more thing? Yes, sir. That example you just gave where it's leads are 
continuing to grow. It's a good problem to have. Yet the conversion patterns, the, the, the first contact, the second contact, and remember full funnel management. It is almost predictable in companies like that. If that's happening to your company, that there is a silo between sales and marketing where marketing is getting rewarded and recognized for increasing the number of leads. And then they kind of wash their hands of it. Hey, I created the leads, nothing I can do about it. That is a disjointed sales and marketing organization. I see it all the time. Here's a great example. In the, the not too distant past, companies would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to participate in the, the big annual trade show. You'd get your booth, you'd fly your people there, you'd have all your invites, you'd have marketing involved, sales involved, you, you got your, your reps flying there, you're getting new clothings and shirts and tchotchkes to give away. And marketing would consider it a success that they generated more leads. And in the not so distant past, a lead was considered somebody putting their business card in the fishbowl for the iPad drawing. <laughs> Right, Doug? Yeah, that's true. That's and marketing true. would say, look, and, and what happened is they get done with the trade show. Then somebody for marketing would input, hand input all the leads or they'd scan, you know, they got better. They could scan the badges and somebody would get their entry to get the iPad or the giveaway of the tchotchke. And marketing would say, we increase leads by 30%. They're all uploaded in Salesforce. Go get them sales. Then marketing would just move on. Intelligent CEOs began asking the questions. What was the ROI? We just spent $400,000 all rolled up on this trade show. What was our return on investment? And nobody could tell them, right? And, and that is always a clear case. It's a predictable pattern that you've got a silo between your marketers and your sellers. And that usually starts at the top. Sales VP and marketing VP are not talking. They're not communicating. They're not you know, and what happens is you talk to the sellers and they go, yeah, these were just, you know, tchotchke seekers and they just put their name in the fishbowl to get the iPad. These leads suck. And that's typically when you investigate that, it's because the sellers make one tertiary phone call. They leave one terrible voicemail. It doesn't get returned and they move about their business. In the middle of that is a business that just spent 100000 400000 50000 on that trade show. And because they didn't have a strategy going in, they lost. That's gold. So if, 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 if you didn't take anything out of that, which I hope you took it all in folks, think of it this way. When you get a lead, how do you get immediate that lead into process, right? That process is engagement. How do you get that lead to engage immediately? How do you get your sales team to engage immediately? And if you have a silo between marketing and sales, and by the way, Gene, in that $48 million company, they did have a, a silo between marketing and sales. Um, if you get a lead in, what is the next step? What has to happen? What are you going to hold your people accountable to? The CEO, or the business owner, driving that commitment all the way through and measuring the metrics all the way through. Gene, <sighs> I could talk to you, as you know, we could talk to each other for two hours, three hours. <laughs> this um, is fun, man. I always like to ask some, uh, pe people this question at the end because it's a, a little different than, than some, but, and if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to, but if you, if you do, that would be great. Um, if you were somebody that could, whether the person is living or in the past, and you could go back in time and you could say, you know what, I would like to do something like this person, or I'd like to be this person. And, and, and if you could be that person, what good in the world would you do? Like, what would you do if you could be that particular person? Well, I, what comes to mind immediately without putting a lot of thought into this is it would be Chet Holmes where you and I met Doug. We were with Chet almost daily in some regards, at least on the phone or through email communication and I didn't really grasp how smart this guy was when I was there. I, I didn't fully appreciate the magnitude of his brilliance. And the, and the reason I say that is I still find myself going back to YouTube and watching some of his videos of conferences that I was there. And 
watching this guy in front of, you know, our very first conference, we remember in Vegas, we had 400 CEOs in the room. There was, uh, the, the, it was, every ticket was, it was $10,000. It, it didn't matter if you brought five people or just yourself. There were no discounts. There were no breaks. There was no freebies. We only had so much room because we had short notice to put on that first business breakthrough event in Mandalay Bay. And that's where they recorded a lot of stuff you can see on YouTube or you can buy the videos, of course, which I highly recommend. And, you know, just kind of taking for granted the, br the brilliance that was right there. Now, granted, I learned a ton, you learned a ton, and here we are now 10 years later and everybody's, you know, all the people that were on that team are doing exceptionally well. I would like to have just spent more time with him, um, less in a tactical matter, which was just trying to, you know, secure the deals and serve the customers and get the growth at the customer level, but to really get inside this guy's brain because he was a unique individual that through sheer will, through, through everything he had learned through, through differing circumstances, through, I think it was Taekwondo, he was a black belt and mm -hmm. how he was raised in different schools. His dad was a military dad, so he's in new schools all the time. And what kind of got his brain wrapped around being so passionate about studying marketing and sales. And, you know, some of the stuff he was teaching, you know, I don't know if, if big corporations were ready for what he was teaching. Um, and, you know, hopefully you and I have done a, 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 a something that he'd be proud of and is carrying the ball forward of the guy's legacy. But if anybody listening to this has never heard of Chet, um, get on YouTube and, and watch his stuff or go to the ultimate uh, what is it? Ultimate, Ultimate sales, sales machine. Machine .com. Mm -hmm. I mean that his book that he wrote in 2007 is still sells, I don't know, 10,000 copies a month somewhere in the world. I mean, that's it, unheard of. It is a very practical, applicable uh, methodology. And we used it all the time. And uh, Chet was a really good guy. He was a nice guy. I remember having dinner with him several times. Uh, remember him playing, uh, showing my kids how to flip numbers in his head at the dinner table. He was, he was just a, a genuine guy. And he told me something one time, he said, you know, the, the original title of the book, the ultimate sales machine was changed by the publisher. He said, I wanted to name it pigheaded discipline and determination <laughs> <laughs> for the successful, uh, you know, entrepreneur. And that's how he lived. It was that pigheaded discipline and determination. And he was very smart and he hired a lot of uh, good people, brought a lot of good people like yourself and, and others uh, and myself to the company. And he turned us loose and he paid us well. And the reality is we followed his methodology and just kept innovating on that methodology and optimizing that methodology all the way through. And that's how his company grew to $27 million in a very short period of time. So Gene, this has been amazing. It's been great. I really appreciate us being here. Any parting words that you have? Well, one of my favorite sayings that I learned in listening to Tony Robbins, another person I'm a huge fan of, is that in life and business, you get rewarded in public for the things you practice the most in private. And that if you can instill a few simple disciplines or wh wherever you are right now, maybe you have some disciplines, but there's another level. Or if your 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 company is struggling right now, maybe your revenue is great, but your profit isn't. That it, one of the keys to change behavior is getting an external voice. And there's no shortage. I mean, just get on LinkedIn. There's no shortage of quote unquote business growth experts. But when you really vet them, you you talk to a guy like Doug Brown that's started 35 companies that's worked around some of the most intelligent people in the world that has a proven track record of, of growing companies. There's a difference. Not every, it's not all this. It's like saying not every doctor is the same. Not every dentist is the same. I've had great lawyers and I've had lousy lawyers, even though their title is lawyer, right? They're not, we're not all the same. You know, not somebody, somebody calls themselves a plumber. Doesn't mean they're a good one, but vet those resources and pick a course, pick a, pick a direction, pick somebody that's, really good at something you're, you have a weakness at and listen to them, pay them. Don't just try to soak them for free information because that's, you know, first, it doesn't feel authentic. And secondly, when you pay somebody for their perspective or their training or their tools or templates, you're going to pay more attention. It's no different than 
going to the gym, if you hire a trainer and you have to pay that trainer in advance, you show up for the darn sessions. And that's what business growth is. It, it's metaphorically the same. I remember Amco used to have this commercial gene that, uh, and they were positioning themselves as the expert, right? Because they would, they would pan out on the commercial to some guy underneath the car, you know, uh, transmission fluid falling all over the place. And, you know, and the guy would turn to his boss and say, well, I always wanted to fix a transmission, right? something like that. And, or I always wanted to work on a transmission, something like that. And then they would pan back to, you know, come to the experts, right? And you pay more at Amco than you do at a place like that. And it's the same thing when you're getting quality of advice. You know, you, you go to the gym, for example, you, you know, you hire a trainer at, you know, $6 an hour. They're not that committed to seeing <laughs> results. Right? So the same thing when it comes to building your business and, you know, look, your business affects not just your life, your family's life, but it affects everybody else's life around and, and it, and it propagates legacies all over the place. We talked about Chet Holmes doing that for us. And um, Gene is spot on and he's a very smart guy. And I highly recommend you go to the salesedge.co, pick up that chapter, hit him up on LinkedIn, give him a call, whatever it might be. Talk to the man. Uh, you'll be glad you did. Gene, I want to hey, thank Doug, you. Well, yes, I'll, I'll add one more thing. For business growth advice, go to Doug Brown. I, I'm not taking on clients anymore. Well, there you have it. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. <laughs> well, truth be told, I'm I'm full time in attention with the company, and um, gladly so. And we're gonna we're gonna build a, you know, I'm gonna build a national brand from scratch, and then probably write a book about it in five years. And you can come back, Doug. Come see me in six months. See how we're doing. I will be happy to. <laughs> so. Well, Gene, thanks again. Really appreciate you being here, folks. Uh, take some actionable uh, lessons out of this and uh, apply something. Don't just listen. So, Gene, thanks again. It's been a pleasure, and it's always great to have conversations with you. Thank you, Doug. My pleasure. Hey, that was another great episode of the CEO Sales Strategy Podcast, and I thank Gene very much for his contributions. Now, don't forget to go get his book at www.thesalesedge.co. Great book, good read. You'll be able to glean a lot out of that book. Now, think about what we talked about here on the commitment side with a CEO or business owner. That business owner has to be committed to driving things forward. You've got to pick a plan and you've got to drive it forward. And that job of the lady or man who is the CEO or business owner of that company is to make sure that everyone is on that page and they're holding them accountable. How do you do that? You're going to measure all the metrics going through the sales process. And then you're going to inspect everything that's going on because people do respect what you inspect. And you want to stay to the fundamentals and the basics in this process, Gene shared, you know, five fundamentals. Uh, and then we talked about 15. There's different metrics that you can measure all the way through. And the more you measure, the more that story comes together, the more that story comes together, the more you will be able to drive revenue through your company because that story will tell you what to do and what not to do. So I really appreciate Gene being on the here. Uh, he and I have known each other for 15 years. He's the real deal. And uh, go get his book at the salesedge.co. And if you like what we're doing here, please comment. And if you really like it, go up and give it a five-star review. I would really appreciate that on the podcast. And let me know what type of topics you'd like to hear more on in the future. And I will be happy to take a look at that and see if we can get a guest that supports what you're looking for. For now, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategy Podcast. Make it a great day and to your success.